Welcome to Behind the Line, where we pull back the curtain on the challenges facing first responders and frontline workers. The work you do is unique, and so are the stresses that go with it. Join me as we tackle key issues to reduce risks for burnout, and as we work to support you in doing the job you love without sacrificing being the kind of person you want to be. Hey there, and welcome back to Behind the Line. As always, I'm your host, Lindsay Foss. For those new to the show, I'm a clinical counselor specializing in trauma therapy, living and working in the lower mainland of BC, Canada. After over a decade working with first responders and frontline workers as a trauma therapist, I've become a passionate wellness advocate and educator for those sacrificing so much of themselves on the front lines. Behind the Line is a place for us to talk about the real life behind the scenes challenges facing you on the front lines. I created this podcast with the hope of bringing easy access to skills for wellness, allowing you to find greater sustainability both on the job and off. I am thrilled to jump into this third episode in our five-week series on self-care. If this is your first time listening, you may want to go back to episode 10 where this series begins. So far, we've covered what self-care isn't, busting many of the myths surrounding self-care, and setting up the science around why we should care about self-care at all. We have also talked about creating an intentional blueprint for self-care, building a plan that includes a solid framework that allows our plan to meet our needs in a comprehensive way. Today we're talking about making our self-care plan personal, intentionally interacting with who we are, what fits for us and our needs, to get the most bang for our buck. Last week, I used the metaphor of building a house. We talked about how, if given the opportunity to build your dream home, most people would take the time to be really thoughtful about how they live, how they would want their home to function, look, and feel to fit them for the long haul. And they would invest in developing solid plans to make the project a success. Last week, we focused on the structure of our self-care dream home, the concepts to focus on to help keep self-care functional and meaningful in our everyday lives. And I talked about this as the blueprint and frame building phase. What we're talking about today is more like the fixtures and finishings phase, the observable, tangible aspects about self-care. Just like constructing a home, the fixtures and finishings you might choose would likely be different from the ones I would choose. We select based on our personal preferences, aesthetic, function for our needs, and fit for our lifestyles. Similarly, this phase of self-care planning needs to be personal, tailored to your interests, preferences, and personality. As we move into today's topic, you're going to want to keep in mind the pieces we covered last week to ensure that your personalized plan covers all the bases and creates accessibility to caring actions throughout various parts of your day, regardless of what's going on. So as a reminder, you'll want to keep time in mind, allowing for actions that can happen when you're low on time, as well as actions that can occupy more time when you have it. You'll want to keep your budget in mind and create a plan that includes actions that are free, cheap, and then more expensive depending on your financial constraints. You'll want to keep energy in mind, intentionally cultivating a plan that includes actions you can do when low on energy, as well as ones you can do when you have energy to burn. And you'll want to keep context in mind, ensuring you have actions you can do when you're at home on your own, at work in the public, with your family, or wherever else you might find yourself, and whomever you might find yourself with. To start our personalized self-care planning, I'm going to suggest that you start by figuring out what you're already doing. No doubt there are already actions and activities that you engage in on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis that could constitute self-care. This is where we need to remind ourselves that lots of actions that we do all the time can be self-caring if done from a heart of care. Remember, this is the key that the intention of the action is in an effort to demonstrate care. Everyday actions that many of us take may already be self-caring or could be reworked to have an intentional heart of caring. 
These might include things like making your favorite foods or foods that you find help you feel good or healthful, grabbing your favorite coffee or smoothie on the way to work, listening to your favorite music in the shower or the car or on your lunch break, going for walks or engaging in movement of some kind during the day, creating spaces that feel calming in your home, at work, or in other spaces, choosing clothing that feels aligned to your needs, for example, warm and cozy, or confidence building, and so on. Choosing scents that allow a deep breath or a reminder of positive associations. The list can go on and on. I've shared about some of my favorites, like the scent of my shampoo being selected to remind me of sipping a pina colada on a beach in a hammock with waves lapping on the shore. Or my favorite coffee to kick off my day. As you walk through the next few days of your life, I want you to take an inventory. Notice the actions you do every day and list out the ones that you're already using strategically as part of your self-care. Then get curious about how you might be able to change your mindset for some of the other activities that could be more self-caring but need you to shift the heart with which you're approaching it. Like anchoring into how good the crisp air feels while you're out for a walk with the dog, instead of begrudging the dog for needing so many walks and resenting your family for ditching you with the responsibility for it. Finally, notice the activities you do every day that may not be self-caring, but could have something added to them to make them carry a bit more bang for their buck. My best example of this is adding listening to your favorite music to your commute, Or one of my favorite hacks, getting a car diffuser and finding an essential oil combo that lets your car ride feel like a space for relaxing breaths. And yes, I'll post my awesome car diffuser and some of my other favorite scents in the show notes for those wanting to try this one out. Once you've inventoried what you're already doing well, as well as noting what you already do that could be creatively tweaked to get you more self-care mileage, Next, I want you to focus in on the shit that needs to happen. This is the stuff we talked about last week as the stuff you need, but doesn't necessarily feel good. This will be things like doctor's visits, dentist appointments, haircuts, taking your medication regularly, and generally prioritizing your health and wellness through things like nutrition, drinking enough water, taking your vitamins or supplements, getting enough sleep, and moving your body. I get that these are not the fun things we think of when we imagine self-care, but they are really necessary. Keep it in context. Self-care is intended to treat ourselves the way we would treat others in an effort to show ourselves value and allow our brains to have what they need to stand a fighting chance against the stress and burnout conditions we face on a daily basis. Just like you would with a child you love, you would do the fun stuff, the loving and nurturing stuff but you would also make them eat their veggies and brush their teeth. You would limit their screen time and make them go to bed by a decent hour. As you build your plan, include in whatever personalized health and hygiene needs might be specific to you. You may have specialist appointments, counseling appointments, specific exercises to rehab injuries, and so on that you'll want to include in this part of your plan. Okay. Now that we're past the basic parts of your self-care plan, we get to move into the fun stuff. To make your self-care plan personal, a great question to ask yourself is, what do I like? Seems a bit obvious, right? But while it's a great question to ask, it also tends to be a lot harder to answer than many might expect. Particularly for adults who have spent much of their lives focused on serving the needs and interests of others. I often have clients who blank stare at me when I ask them what they like, and after a few awkward moments, they'll laugh nervously and say something like, I should know this, shouldn't I? The reality is that we tend to defer from ourselves to make sure everyone else is doing okay, everyone else's needs are met, and we leave ourselves on the back burner for so long that we can actually lose touch with what we like enjoy, or find meaningful. Even more complicated, we can do this for so long and to such an extreme 
that even when we are doing something we might enjoy, we don't feel connected to actually feeling the enjoyment of it. If this is where you're at, don't panic. We'll get there. It just might take a beat. What I can tell you is that you are about to embark on an adventure. The challenge being put to you is to take on the hat of a researcher scientist or an explorer adventurer or some combination if that sounds really cool and enticing to you and gets you motivated to try some things out. Creating a personalized self-care plan is going to require that you experiment a bit. Try on some different things and see what fits. Be curious about activities that you may have never thought to consider before, and be willing to venture into them with an open mind and a willingness to learn what you like, what you don't, and what lives in between. If you're struggling to imagine where to even start, I have a few suggestions for you to help you get your brainstorming juices flowing. Suggestion number one, let's go back, way back. And remember things you used to enjoy when you were a kid or a young person. When you were uninhibited and fully focused on finding joy, what did you gravitate towards? These are often things that our hearts continue to feel connected to, even when we're grown up and stuffy. When I think back, I used to love planning things. Whether it was hatching a plan to spy on our parents while they did intriguing things like fix the car, or planning how we could build a ramp to jump the huge mud puddle in the back alley of our neighborhood, I loved thinking strategically, solving problems, and navigating challenges. I also loved swinging, and I loved dancing, and was a highly competitive dancer for most of my young life. As an adult, looking back on these aspects of me and what I genuinely enjoyed when I was little, I find this to be a great roadmap to start from. I take my kids to the park often, and while they're running around playing tag or climbing things or riding their bikes in circles, you will find me on the swings every time. I've taken dance classes throughout my adult life just to stay connected to this thing that brings out a side of me that feels familiar and wonderful. And my family knows mommy will bust a move at a moment's notice. I hatch plans. This has shown up in my work in really big ways, but I'm also the first to help my kids strategize a Nerf gun attack against their dad or map out a plan to help them build the most amazing racetrack or train track you can imagine. If you think back to when you were a kid, what was it that you did a lot of or found yourself really enjoying? Were you an avid reader? Did you love sports? Were you imaginative or artistic? Take some time to reflect and see if you can come up with some ways that your adult body can give your child heart a blast from the past once in a while. I promise, these ones feel great, except when we realize our bodies don't bend like they used to, but find ways to adapt what you once loved to be possible for your grown-up self. Also, you don't have to be good at the things. You just have to enjoy them. So if you were artistic as a kid, but you haven't improved since you were six, who cares? Go get a grown-up coloring book and some pencil crayons and color your heart out. No one's checking to see if you're coloring in the lines. Suggestion number two, take a look around and notice what other people seem to enjoy. People come from all different walks of life and have such unique and diverse lived experiences. I grew up in a middle-class family that lived in Calgary for a good part of my early life. I'm the eldest of three girls, and our parents worked hard to offer us a wonderfully average life. We went to dance classes where I excelled, but my sisters weren't as into it, so they tried soccer and softball. We went to school, we had our activities, we did our homework and chores. It was lovely, but I remember moments of meeting kids who had totally different experiences from mine. Like a good friend whose parents were archaeologists. Her home was filled with books and art and interesting artifacts. 
She went traveling, ate foods I would never consider trying, and loved backcountry camping and roughing it. I thought she was weird, although I totally adored her. As I grew up and started my adult life, I realized I wanted to try things, experiment with ways of living that I hadn't had as a kid. I started rock climbing. My husband and I started doing multi-day hikes, including the Grand Canyon, and we started traveling to places most people don't go, like Nicaragua and East Africa. Thanks to the influence of others in my life and a willingness to step outside of my comfort zone, I have learned that I love adventure and spontaneity when I'm outside of my regular life. I thrive in stressful situations and can hold my own even when I don't speak the language. I've been reminded that I love challenges and overcoming, and I use these learnings to continue to experiment with what I like and what I want to do next as I continue to adapt my self-care. I've watched those I know get into all kinds of different things, and admittedly, at first I usually poo-poo them as dumb. Essential oils are a solid example. I remember when my sister-in-law started selling essential oils. I rolled my eyes, and honestly, I thought it was stupid. But once I tried it out, I became a convert. I have a diffuser in my office, my car, and three at home. My favorite combination is orange and vanilla, which ends up smelling like a creamsicle, and my internal eight-year-old heart is so happy. I also love a couple of others that I'll link to in the show notes that help me breathe easier when I'm stressed or feel more regulated when my emotions are running on overdrive. The point of all of this is allow yourself to be influenced by others. Be curious. Ask questions and be willing to try things you might not ordinarily gravitate towards. You might surprise yourself. At worst, you try something and you learn you don't love it, but you risk learning that you have a whole new set of things to add to your self-care repertoire. Suggestion number three, reflect on what you know about yourself. This is a bit connected to the idea of what do you like, but it goes a bit deeper to ask what you're all about. Consider your personality, your personal characteristics, and then think of what kinds of activities allow these to shine. One of the things I've known about myself my whole life is that I'm a highly competitive person. I like winning. This has certainly been a trait I've had to work at to keep it from damaging parts of my life, but it has also been something that has advised some really helpful self-care. Prior to kids, my husband and I used to host regular board games night. We even bought this huge long table to seat more people and to be able to spread out games while also being able to have drinks and snacks easily accessible. Yeah, we bought our dining table to fit games night. It became epic, with friends coming every week to connect and play Ticket to Ride or Settlers of Catan or Killer Bunnies. It allowed the competitive part of me to run wild while also feeding my need for social connection and yummy treats. Allow yourself to think about who you are, what gets you going, and how can you adapt activities that allow those parts of you to come to life and thrive. Suggestion number four, when all else fails, attend to your five senses. Your body has five senses, and it likes to make use of these both for survival to notice when things aren't okay, but also for pleasure. Your five senses, as a result of the work you do, likely have been wired towards survival, detecting indicators of threat and activating your stress response system to keep you safe. Triggering sights, smells, and so on can activate our stress center, even when things are fine simply because these were connected to a time when things weren't fine. Using your five senses strategically to encourage connection to calm or enjoyment helps to strengthen your brain's frontal region that supports counterbalancing stress responses. One of the best things I ever did was go into a local store that sells essential oils. I know, I know, I'm talking about essential oils a lot and I'm sorry. 
But seriously, I went into this store and they had a full aisle of tester bottles of every scent under the sun. I spent about half an hour sniffing every bottle, trying to find those few scents that gave me that big breath feeling. It was great, and I used them all the time. Think about the scents that support calm or that allow you to take a deep breath or that your brain associates with positive memories or feelings. Experiment with flavors that you enjoy, like your morning coffee, or a piece of chocolate, or a wintergreen mint. Find visual cues that help you feel calm, like keeping things with your favorite color in different parts of your home or at work. Have your favorite music or sounds accessible to listen to, and find textures you like and incorporate these into your day like soft socks, a fuzzy blanket, a warm heating pad, or silky jammies. Use your senses in your favor to help counteract the way they sometimes get hijacked away from you. Finally, if you're needing help coming up with ideas, Google can be a great helper. There are a million and one lists of self-care ideas living on the internet. It can get a bit overwhelming to scan through, so for those of you who would like to use it, I've included links to a couple of the lists that I found that I liked, and I've linked to them in the show notes for today's episode. Before we wrap up today, I also want to say that an important part of personalizing self-care involves realizing that what you like or find helpful can change from one moment to the next. Making self-care personal means being connected with ourselves in the moment that we're trying to offer ourselves care. Listening to ourselves. It's a bit like if I asked my kid to tell me about his day while scrolling Facebook and only half listening to him. Sure, I'm trying to demonstrate care in showing an interest in how he's doing and what he's up to, but it's not really going to feel like care to him if he can see I'm not really attending to what he's saying or engaging with him more than some uh uh-huhs. We need to pay attention to ourselves and notice when something is working for us and when it's not. I mentioned earlier that I love planning. Since childhood, it's been a thing I gravitate towards. As a result, there are parts of my work that feel really enjoyable. I've learned that I enjoy website building and creating these podcast episodes and other resources because they allow me to engage my creativity and love for problem solving. There are days where this feels fun and I can relax and work on some of these bits and pieces while sipping my coffee, and at the end I feel refreshed and productive. But there are other times when it doesn't feel like self-care. I'll notice that while I'm doing it, my heart rate increases and my muscle tension's higher, and that these are the times when it's more like work. I've learned to notice which is which, and how to time when I use them. Sometimes you really just do have to do the work, even though it doesn't feel great. But I've learned to notice that if what I'm needing is to add in some self-care, and this is a time where this kind of thing feels like work, I might need to change gears and use a different self-care strategy and leave the work for another time. At the end of the day, stay focused on the goal. Self-care is about valuing you. It's about being connected with you and prioritizing your needs to help restore you sufficiently to allow you to continue showing up for others in the way you choose to. I hope that this has helped to kick off some brainstorming for you. Parts of what we talked about today are the pieces we'll be diving into a bit deeper during the Self-Care Dare 5-Day Challenge for first responders and frontline workers. So if you want extra resources to help take what you're mulling today and turn it into a legitimate plan, I hope you'll consider registering for the challenge. The link for the registration page will be in the show notes as well. As always, I hope you'll share this with your friends and coworkers to support frontline wellness on a wide scale. Take care of yourselves, and until next time, stay safe.